Chris, Chris uh, Rivera is going to stop by here in a minute and talk to us about in, uh, uh, finances for, and investing and that kind of stuff. There's Luis. Yeah. Why don't we do this while we're waiting for people to come in? Uh, I don't know about you, David. Did you have a chance to read what we're uh, we were working on the lead generation model of the real the real estate investor? Okay. Uh, any ahas from that section? Because I'll, I'll tell you what I took out of that. Go ahead, please. A couple of things that actually surprised me. That I was like, oh, I did not, I did not think of that. So, anything stand out to you in there? Because I'll tell you what stood out to me. You know, uh, not really, Ed. I, I was. Uh, let, let me just take a look at something here. Hi, Luis, how are you? So the part that, that I, uh, that really stuck out to me, uh, was going, hey, hey, Luis, um, the part that stood out to me is that, uh, it's this chart on page, uh, where's it at? It talks about wanting to be in the middle of the market on page, it, it's a, there's a figure on page 182, but, but more importantly, uh, the reasons why and all that. He said that uh, in general, with single family homes, you're going to get better appreciation. And in general, with multifamily, you're going to get better cash flow. That's a, apparently, that's an old rule of thumb. And it does, it does pan out oftentimes. Not, it's not like a foolproof thing, but uh, that is one way of looking at it that is the general rule. Um, and then it, he also said that the, the, uh, that chart on page 182, that, that you want to be in the middle of the market between low end and high end properties, right? So you don't want to be like the highest end, the highest of the high end properties, but you also don't want to be just like the worst of the worst and, you know, it, uh, in a slum kind of place. And and then, especially on the, on the, the figure on page 34, right? Uh, on, on page 182, figure 34. This, this I thought was really cool. And, I, and by the way, it kind of makes sense. Like when I look at that, I'm like, oh yeah, I can totally follow that. So if you look at cash flow, low end properties tend to be the best cash flow. And by the way, in my studies, I, I have generally found that to be true. Like around here in LA, if you go to Lawndale and places like that, you're going to get better cash flow. Percentage-wise, of course, we're not. We're talking always percentage-wise. We're not talking actual values because it's all, it's all just a matter of percentage. Uh, but you get better cash flow, uh, you know, better cap rates and all that in lower end in lower end properties, low income properties. You get uh, less uh, cap rate usually at the higher end properties. So we're talking the beach, the you know Sand Hill section in Manhattan Beach, um, that kind of stuff. Uh, he talks about hassle. I thought this was like a really neat thing that, that I've never seen somebody quantify it before. He saw my hassle. He says like really low end properties, big hassle. And I totally get that, man, because yeah, that's my experience too. Like when you have a place that's like in a really bad neighborhood, shit, man. I, I, I remember having friends renovating a property in Charleston and they were renovating in a really bad neighborhood. And, you know, the, the, the home kept getting broken into and stuff stolen as they were like putting it together. And it was just a total pain, you know, pain in the ass. And on the flip side of that, you know, when you have a, a, a you're renting out a single family home like that's on the beach in Manhattan Beach, you know, from having been at Sotheby's for a number of years and, and knowing people who have rented properties like that, you know, that's a, that's a pain in the ass in its own right in a whole different way because the clientele who rents out those places very particular and you know they'll call you in the middle of the night at 3 a.m when the light bulb is out because they feel like i'm paying twenty five thousand dollars a month you know everything should work perfectly at every minute and if it doesn't you should have somebody out here five minutes ago to, to have repaired it um so i thought that was pretty true and then appreciation he talks about and it kind of makes sense too that uh low-end properties is generally you know uh, may lag behind on appreciation and then Generally, there's the most demand for those mid-range homes. That's where most of the market is. So that will tend to appreciate the most, is what he's saying. And, and then liquidity also makes sense, too, that that middle of the market is the easiest to get rid of in a hurry, right? 
if you have a part uh, a property in a very bad you know a very low price part of town going to be hard to get you know hard to get rid of for different reasons well, it's not a big clientele for that if you want to get rid of a 20 million dollar property on the beach also hard to get rid of because there's not that many buyers for it right so all of that kind of made sense to me what do you guys think by the way uh miguel and, and hope what we're talking about figure 34 on page 182 of the book David, Luis, you guys have any opinion on that? I mean, not that you have to. I'm just that's that's what stood out to me. I was like, oh, that, that's interesting. I found that to be really interesting, and it, and it made sense to me at least in, in theory. Well, in my opinion, uh, that is true in general. If you talk about you know low end and high end, definitely what the book says is true in general. Yeah, but. Sometimes you just have to look at each individual property by itself. Yeah. And uh, why, you know, and everybody's case is different, you know, what they're looking for and how much work they want to put into it. Yeah. I find that, you know, the people who actually make good money and they're really good investors, they find some property that they can actually do value add to it. They can add value to it. And by adding the value, you increase the rent and you increase the, uh, the value of the property um, overall. Yeah. Um, for example, I, I, was, uh, you know, I bought a property uh, in Texas and I was walking around that property. Let me just tell you what it is. It was just a mobile home park. And uh, that property had private sewer and private water. That means well water and septic tanks. Yeah. As I was walking the property in front of the property, I noticed that there's a fire hydrant. That told me that there is city water, but nobody re really bothered going after that. Yeah. So I brought water in. That alone, mobile home parks, once you bring city water and city sewer, the value goes up by at least 20, 25%. Yeah. Because there's yeah. less hassle. Yeah. So it's just a matter of bringing value to the property. That's what it's all about. Yeah, that's that's really smart. I love that. Anybody else? Comments? We're, we're talking about uh, figure 34 on page 182 of the blue book. The other, the other part that stuck out to me, um, by, by, and by the way, for anyone interested, uh, I ended up getting this book on Audible just because I was like, you know what? Uh, I'm finding it hard to find time to read right now during the holidays. Kids, you know, my kids are home all the time. We're staying up late doing all sorts of, you know, Christmassy projects and stuff. So I got the Audible book on this, and it, it's, uh, I, it's fun to listen to it on the way, you know, to and from work. It's like that's like that. Both of those combined, that's an hour of reading a day just by listening to the audio books. Anyways, for whatever it's worth. Um, the other part that stuck out to me was. Uh, talking about zoning and if, if you're smart and savvy oftentimes you can make a play based on zoning I thought that was really interesting he gives an example of uh, I, I don't know what pages on or anything because I, I listened to it in the car uh, he talks about buying a property that was commercial and it had utilities and the place next door to it was also commercial and had no utilities so he bought both properties and then created a uh, what do you call it? Uh, and not an easement. Is it it's a utility easement? Am I getting that right? Is that right? Utility easement to basically get to, to make sure that the place that didn't have utilities now had access to utilities, and they changed the zoning to go from commercial, uh, commercial office space to commercial retail because this was a part of town that was developing pretty quickly. And they said together, he said those two things combined made him six hundred and seventy thousand dollars if I remember the number correctly. So that, I thought that was just neat. And all of it was because they were smart enough to realize that they could make a play based on zoning. So, you know, smart stuff yet again, right? So uh, that's why we do all the, all the homework and all that kind of stuff. Any other comments? So anybody have any comments from the lead generation model? No. You know, uh, Ed, just to kind of touch on what you were, uh, you were just talking about, it, yeah. it's... Um, that I'm thinking of SB9 and uh, I'm looking around, I'm finding properties and it's like a two bed, one bath house 
on this huge lot that's just all yard. And yeah. uh, when I when I see it now, I think, oh wow, that that'd be perfect for a duplex. Have a yard for each of the units, and then um, yeah, with the rental rates being what they are. But yeah. That, that yeah, I quickly realized I have no idea what the building cost would be, the process, or or what the math looks like in in, in that process. But yeah, I'm starting to think there's, differently. There's a company around, like nearby that I've seen flyers for that they they're built around building your ADU for you. Like they, that's that's their whole purpose in life. And I, I don't have access to it right now because I, I didn't prepare that. It just you just reminded me of it right now. But I'll see if I can if I can figure it out if I can rem if I can remember where I saw that at. And, and I've seen it no multiple times. Um, if I find it, I'll post it on the Facebook group. But yeah, there, there's companies that. Basically, it's a contractor that's very savvy with the ADU laws, and they'll let you, they'll help you figure out how to do all of that. So, I, but you bring up a great point. That is a that is, I think right now you guys know how I feel about uh, uh, real estate in California. But that is that's something I would make an exception for. If I could find a play to put an ADU on a lot, or or to, you know add, add something something where I could add more, you know, another unit to a property. I mean, you could just crush it, uh, you know, doing, do, doing that, uh, you know, for yeah. years in North Redondo, in, in North Redondo beach, uh, people have been buying these seven, you know, uh, uh, was it 7,500 square foot lots, 50 by 150 lots and making them into 200 lots. Right. I mean, that's, that's been going on for years. There's hardly any single family homes left in all of North Redondo because of that. But for years and years, that was a great play. You'd buy a lot for like, like when I was looking at it a couple of years ago, and and by the way, what's his name? Uh, Merit Realty, uh, Amir Amiri is the one who's like, I mean, he's he's probably done a hundred of them. His whole little company that's they that's their bread and butter is just buying single family homes in North Redondo and putting two on a lots on them or three on a lots now. And you, talk, basically you, you can buy uh, uh, I don't know about any more, but uh, when I when I looked at it, because at one time I was kind of curious, like how much money is he making all that. You could buy a home uh, a lot or tear down for that matter for about a million, 1.2 million, 1.2 in there, and then spend what, uh, 300 square foot on. So we're talking 2,000 square feet times two, so 4,000 square feet times 300 square foot. Put about, a, uh, well, it's not, I'm sure he's doing it for much less than that. Uh, put about $600,000 building to, to, uh, townhome units attached and now each one of those is worth he was selling for about 1.5 at the time I mean you do the numbers and that's there's a whole lot of room in there that's a whole lot of profit so uh, you're talking about those uh those really narrow lots that are um they're they're really deep but they're narrow in uh kind of North Redondo area yeah uh so there's the Golden Hills area and that, that's a little different that you might be thinking of that these okay. are just regular maybe single family lots. I mean, they're, they're standard size 50 by 150. It's not, uh, it's pretty standard, but yeah, he would, he would pick those up and, and, and turn those into two or three on a lot. And he, he's not the only one, but I would say he probably has more than 50% of the market of doing that, but there's wow. not really much market left because there's hardly any single family homes left that you can do that with. Um, wow. And, and by the way, so related to this, I had a, a listing that was in North Redondo single family home could be a teardown, but for some reason, somebody over the years had sold off the back part of the property. So it was missing, like all the lots around there, all 50 by 150. But then when you look at it, the, you look at the lot, right? He had somebody, you know, like 20 years ago had sold off like the, what was it? The last 25 feet of the lot, right? So instead of 50 by 150, it was like 50 by 100 or 50 by 125 or something. I forget the exact numbers right now, but I remember that whoever did that was a jackass because uh, even though it was zoned R2, you couldn't split up the lot because it's zoned R2. However, the Redondo Beach city code also says that you have to have a minimum of 6,000 square feet in order to build a two on a lot. And his was like 5,500 or something. And because of that, this, what would have been a $1.2 million lot I think he ended up selling it for like 750 or something like that because it was who could only ever be a single family home. And it was a weird lot and it was like not quite worth tearing down, but not work. It was just, it was like in this awful zone in the middle where it, 
it didn't make sense for like a primary, you couldn't like move into it tomorrow and you couldn't sell it, you know, you couldn't flip it because there wasn't enough profit. It was just, that's why they ended up selling for, 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 they basically gave it away, you know? And they gave, they gave it away, it was what it was worth. But all of that, were, the reason why it was worth that, that minimal amount is because of zoning laws and exactly what we're talking about. Anyways, so just some, some knowledge for you guys. Um, anyways, so hey, we got, we got guests here, Chris Rivera. Let me do this. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Can you hear me? Hey, hey, I can hear you. So, so the microphone is up there, but the, the camera is off. Okay, so I'll try to talk. I'm going to give you the spotlight. Why don't we spotlight? Yeah. Right. So I, I talked to uh, Ed earlier. He, he told me that you guys were going to be covering some investment properties and kind of wanted me to come in and just talk about the financing end of uh, investment properties. So, hey, Chris. Uh, hey, Chris. Ahead. Is it possible if you could turn on the laptop microphone as opposed to the other one? You can hear no, you better. Ahead, if you can turn on. How's that? Oh, great. Oh, geez, I can hear myself as well. I got reverb yeah, coming big back difference. to me. All right, so, um, so basically, uh, I jotted some notes down for you guys. I mean, there's a lot of differences between owner occupied and non owner occupied. Um, the first thing, you know, we look at it, it's going to be interest rate. Interest rates different between owner occupied and non owner. Typically, what you're going to see is a spread of three eighths to a half point higher, just depending on FICO score uh, in property makeup. Um, and the reason for that is there's just more risk to the investor who buys that note. Um, and the rationale behind that is when people get into trouble, they typically will let go of investment properties first before they let go of their own primary um, because they got to secure their own family and, and that sort of thing. So that's why there's a little added layer of risk. And that's why you're dealing with higher interest rates. But that's across the board. It doesn't matter what lender you talk to. You're always going to see a little higher interest rate. And that's the reason for it. Um, but there's a lot of differences when you start looking at investment properties. I mean, it's it's a great vehicle to buy for your, your retirement or just for your portfolio in general, especially now when you see what the appreciation has been over the last few years. I mean, can you imagine someone who bought an investment property just four years ago? I mean, not only are they getting the cash flow, but they've got this increase in equity that's just off the charts. Um, you know, there's a lot that goes into investment properties in terms of, of your knowledge with the properties. But, you know, I'm not going to talk about that when it comes to the maintenance and, the, and, and that sort of thing, because there's a lot to it. So you want to make sure that they're aware of that, because it's not something that you just like, you know, your typical investment where you just put money into it and you just sit back and let it just kind of grow as the market grows. This is something where you really got to get your hands uh, dirty and, and, and know what you're going to do when the maintenance um, comes and the repairs come and you've got to make sure that you've got something set aside because if you don't repair it or properly maintain it then all of a sudden it's not that positive or really good cash flow that you thought you were getting yourself into um, you know one time someone told me when they bought an investment there were three things they were always looking at plumbing electric and roof um, and actually a fourth foundation too but those are the structural things to a house. You want to make sure those are solid because those are probably the, the, the biggest um, expenses you're going to have if you ever have to repair or fix. So those are probably things that you just want to be mindful of when you're looking at. I mean, all the other stuff you can add to the house. You, you can, you know, paint it. You can do the decor and all that stuff to make it look nicer. But if it's got rundown roof and in, in you know, that, that's just an added expense that you're not really trying to get yourself into because you're looking for cash flow. So we as an investor or lender are really making sure that you can support the debt load of the property that you're buying. Um, we're also going to look at cash flow, but we look at it differently. Most people, when they look at an investment, they're thinking of their own personal cash flow. They're not looking at all the other expenses that may go into owning property. And that's what we make sure that we do for you. So what we do is, let, let's just suppose someone's buying a million dollar property, it's a duplex, right? Um, all investment properties are gonna require a minimum of 25% down. That's the first thing. You're not gonna get anything, low, well, I shouldn't say that. That's, that's the sweet spot, 25% down. I can find you sources for 20 and 15%. 
um, but you're going to have a, added to the interest rate on top of what we just talked about. And so it's not as advantageous to a borrower because now your interest rates higher, your payments higher, that sort of thing. But your typical investment, you're talking about units two, three, or four, um, is going to be 25%. Now, what we do when we look at um, someone who's trying to qualify for it, we set the property off to, to the side. And it, it's just like qualifying for a debt load. We don't typically qualify you just like your normal purchase. And, and those of you who have closed um, primary residence, you know, when you talk to a lender, they're going to tell you your borrower is qualified for 900,000 with 10% down at a three and a half percent interest rate, right? And that, that's what you go shop for. You look for SFR at, at 950 and, and you know that you're good. Well, when we come to units, it, it's not so much that you're looking at a particular sale price. You're really looking at a debt load that they can qualify for. Because as I said, when we qualify someone for an investment property, we put that property off to its side and we see if it's a positive cash flow or a negative cash flow. And the way we do it is going back to our scenario of a million dollar purchase price, they put 25% down. So you have a loan amount of 750. What we're looking for is just hypothetically, let's say that that mortgage on that 750 is something like $4,500 PITI, okay? So what we're going to do is we're gonna look at the rents collected. And what are we gonna get for the, the, the duplex? How many rents are we getting? We're gonna get 2,500 for the front house and we're gonna get 2,500 for the back house, right? So it's $5,000 a month. So your investors thinking, hey, this is great. This is the positive cash flow for me because my PITI is only 4,500. I got $5,000 rent incoming, right, each month. Well, that's true. That is the positive cash flow for them on a monthly basis. But when we qualify, we don't take that into consideration. What we're looking at is what are the rents collected? And it's $5,000 a month. And we're going to hit the file for an expense factor or maintenance factor of 25%. So we're really only going to give you 75% of the rents collected. So the $5,000 rents all of a sudden turns into $3,750. That's the rents that we're gonna to use to allocate towards the PITI. In our case here, we have 37.50 as the rents collected, 75% of, PITI is $4,500. That means we have a negative cash flow of 750. Now your investor might freak out and say, oh, I don't want a negative cash flow of 750. But keep in mind, that's just for qualifying. And the reason why we do that is because we wanna make sure that if there's any material uh, maintenance or repairs or even vacancy where you can't rent it for a month or two, you can still cover uh, the mortgage. So that's the reason for that 25% vacancy factor, as we call it. So in this case, what I'm doing is qualifying this person, not for that property per se, but for that debt load of $750. And really when we qualify, or I should say, when we pre-qualify a borrower, that's really what I'm qualifying to pre uh, pre-qualifying a borrower for. It's a certain amount of debt load that they could have. Can you have a $200 neg? Can you have a $500 negative cash flow? Can you have a $1,000 cash flow that's negative? Now, of course, at some point, they're not going to want that large of a negative cash flow, right? Um, but it just depends on the makeup of the property. And that's why when it comes to investment properties, those are a little bit more tied to us because we have to see them as you're making the offer. So we, we want to know what are the rents collected? What's the property makeup, that sort of thing. And then I can cash flow you and see if they can handle that debt load. But typically when I'm going to pre-qualify one of your borrowers, I'm gonna tell them, you can handle a $600 negative cash flow. Tell me what property you're looking at. I'll run the numbers and I'll make sure that's a, at least a $600 negative cash flow or less. But that's how we're looking at investment properties. So, you know, the first thing is don't be, scared when I say it's a $600 native cash flow because it might be a break even for them, right? And it's a really good piece of property. It's going to rent out. All, the, all the, the tenants are in place in terms of good roof, good foundation, good electric, good plumbing. You're not going to have any issues. It's a great locale. You have no issues running it out, right? So you're always going to get 100% of what you're getting. But again, we're still going to go 75%. It doesn't matter. So that's what we're doing when we're qualified. We're not qualifying you for a particular sale price. We're qualifying you for a particular debt load that you can handle because we treat that debt load, 
debt load, just like any other debt that you might have on your credit report, whether it's an auto loan or a student loan or any installment loan, revolving loan, that sort of thing. So that's what we're doing when we qualify. Um, you know, guidelines. Can I, can I ask a question about that? Sure. So does that mean that, say, as an individual, as a family, uh, my wife and I can afford a million dollar home. That's, that's what we qualify. If, if we were going to buy a single family home to live in. However, if I was to buy an investment property and let's say it's a, a, a quad, four units, and it's, it's, uh, makes it you know, has a nice cash flow to it. Uh, it's pulling a lot of property that maybe I might even be able to qualify for more than a million because the rents will be taken into account. That is sure. Yes. So in, in that case, absolutely. If you're buying that million dollar property and let's say we, we looked at something that was only generating $5,000 rental income, right? Let's say it was $7,000 rental income. Okay. We're still going to use the same 75% number on that. All of a sudden that's 35, 17, 52, five is the 75% of that seven grand, right? Which is more than 4,500. Now you have $750 income. So I put that in the income column. So yes, that can help you qualify for more. So that's why it's, you know, they're all case by case. If you've got a positive cash flow, yeah, it might take you up into well over a million because we thought maybe we we're only at a million, but you really could buy a million too if you had the right cash flow on a particular property. And that's why, again, you're tied to the to lender to call them and say, hey, look, this is the property I'm looking at. Here's the rents collected, the property makeup, what's the cash flow on it? And then I can tell you if you're going to qualify. But again, we're looking for a debt load because most of the time it's either a break even or just a little bit as a negative cash flow in our terms. So we're just letting you know, hey, go out there and find it, but you can go ahead and qualify for a five or 600 negative cash flow. But as positive, absolutely will help you qualify. So someone who maybe did a refi and they were barely squeaking by getting qualified and they don't think they could qualify for a rental property, they may, because again, maybe they're putting 50% down because 25 is the minimum, but what if they're putting 50% down or more because maybe they're doing a 1031 exchange and they're taking equity from another property into this one. So all of a sudden the PITI is lower. Then again, the, the net is a positive and if it's positive, it goes to their income qualifications. Um, you know, when we talk about guidelines, there's a lot of other guidelines that we're going to make sure that they meet. It's not just qualifying for it, but we also have to make sure that the property is up to standard as well. Um, a lot of times when we look at units, there's a lot of makeshift things. So you just want to do the eye test, make sure you're walking through the properties and see if there's anything that, that kind of looks funky. Um, and what I mean by that is there's a lot of additions that were unpermitted, right? And you guys know what I'm talking about. You see those on SFRs. We see those on units too, because a lot of times they're trying to put on a back shed to, to maybe get a third unit or knock a wall down or something like that. You just want to make sure that there's none of that funky stuff. Um, and if there is, tell yourself, is this done in a workmanlike manner? And that's really what's important for us. Because if they did an addition, we can't give it value for what they added, but we won't hurt the file if it's done in a workmanlike manner. Because we really, as lenders, don't require permits per se on additions. We just don't. We stopped that a decade plus ago. Um, but what we require is that the property is done in a workmanlike manner, meaning there's no slopage issues or there's no you know, visible defects of what you added on. It's not done in, in shoddy type of, of um, um, uh, renovations when they did it. You just want to make sure that it's done, again, in a workmanlike manner. And it's the same thing even when you're dealing with SFRs, you know, on a side. But that's one of the biggest things I see is um, when we talk about units, a lot of times is units typically are investment properties. And so the owner didn't live in them and they were trying to maximize rent. So they maybe added on to it, whether it was permitted or not, but they did it anyway. So those are the things that you just want to be mindful of. Um, and if you're not sure, take a snapshot and send it to me. Let me take a look at it. I do that for agents all the time. They'll send me a picture. And if I'm not sure, I can run it up to our deal desk and just make sure the investor desk looks at it um, and, and make sure that it's a okay for you guys. So, um, you know, that, that's another thing that, that I see a lot in, in investment guidelines that are different. 
Um, let's see, after that, we talked about qualifying, how we're gonna qualify you. Um, I would say that, you know, a lot of times, if you're dealing with someone who's looking to build their portfolio, and if they don't own a home, buy the units first. It's a lot easier to buy owner occupied if you if you already own units, because you can buy an SFR after units. And the reason why I say that is because you can buy units with less down um, if it's owner occupied. You can try to go FHA. FHA only requires three and a half percent down. Um, so you can get in there with less down and live there for 12 months, and then you can move out of there and then you can buy another property owner occupied again with limited down, maybe 5% if you're, if you're buying under a million dollars. So it's a way for you guys to just educate your borrowers who are thinking big term of like, you know what, this is what I wanna do. I wanna buy a home and I wanna buy units. Educate them that it's better if they can buy units first and then buy your SFR. Um, because you're going to be able to buy both of them and acquire them. Because if you buy the SFR first, again, now you got to meet that requirement of 25% down. And that's harder to accomplish, especially if you just put all this money down on your primary, right? Um, now it takes you years to be able to accumulate those funds to be able to do that. So, you know, I always tell people if you can buy the units first. Um, you know, in, in today's market, there's something that hit me when I was writing down some notes to talk about. Um, today, you've got a lot of your past clients or your friends or acquaintances that are sitting on a lot of equity. I mean, the market's just been on fire the last three or four years, and we're seeing equity growth of, God, 35 to 50%, depending on the, the pocket where they bought, right? Um, tap into that. Uh, it's a good time to tap into it. Rates are still low, although they're going to start taking off um, don't want to get into rates too much, but rates are, are escalating. They're going to continue to escalate. That's what the Fed's announced yesterday. They're going to end the tapering and they're going to start to raise um, the Fed's fund rate three times next year, twice in 2023, which just tells us rates are going up. They're going to hit the fours, mid fours, and possibly higher. But rates are going away from us. So now is the time if you're going to pull cash out, do it now and just park the money on the side. Um, in preparation of if they're truly wanting to buy something uh, because money's cheap. You can still get money cash out at three and a half percent or below, depending on their FICO score in the property type. Um, but, you know, it's a great way for you guys to kind of reconnect with some of your past clients, possibly just let them know, Hey, there's some great opportunities out here. You guys are sitting on a lot of equity. Um, you know, we had this conversation years past. You said you wanted to buy some units or other properties and stuff. Now might be the time to do it, or at least pull the money out, sit it on the side, and let's be prepared for, you know, when you find something. Chris, um, quick question on that. So I'm going to open it up for questions. Okay. So right now, anyone have any questions at all? I have a question. Can you hear me? Hello? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hold on. Give me a second, you guys. Hold on one second. Uh, I think, all right, that should work better. Can you hear me now? No? Oh, yes. there you are. Hey, Camille. Hey, hey, how are you, Chris? What's happening? Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Hey, quick question on that. So in terms of equity, um, pulling that out, in order to lock it in, obviously you have to start paying on it, right? Because the line of equities are are going to be moving with, with the market. So you're going to have a small payment associated with that. You just have to, that's part of having that security of locking it in, I guess. Right. Yeah. So there's two ways to pull cash out. Basically you could do a cash out refi straight, right? And, and the only issue with that is you pull all this money out and you're paying on it, I think is what you're alluding to there. Because you're paying on it and you haven't really found the property yet. So some people are a little leery of that. But if that's truly your goal, that's probably the best thing to do so that you've got the money you set aside and you've got a, a lower interest rate. The other way to do it is, as you mentioned, an equity line. An equity line, you don't pay if you don't have a balance on it because it works just like a credit card. And they pretty much will take you to the same LTVs um, in LTV is loan to value. So, in, in, and I shouldn't even say that because some, some lenders on a HELOC will take you to 90. And we're starting to see that a little bit more and more because the market's increased over the last three, four years. So the second trustee lenders came back and they're okay with going higher and loan to value. 
So you can set someone up with an equity line in preparation of buying this. So what they do is they just have this credit card, if you will, that's a side that has, you know, $200,000 at their ex expense if they need it when they buy their properties. Now, the only issue with that is when you pull it out, you now have that on an equity line, which is a variable interest rate. It's going to be tied to prime. And as I had mentioned earlier, the feds are going to increase the feds fund rate, which is directly tied to prime. Prime is typically 3% over the feds fund rate. The feds fund rate is a quarter for big banks it's zero, but it's really a quarter. So prime right now is three and a quarter. So as they raise that and next year, they said three times, typically it's a quarter a whack when they increase it. That tells us prime is going to go up to four, possibly four and a half. Right, so their interest rate starts to climb. And the way the HELOCs work is there's two components to it. There's a margin plus an index. An index is what you're tied to, and that's your prime. It could be a T-bill, most are, are tied to prime. And then you're gonna have a margin over that, which is the spread to the investor. That's their profit margin. So the, they'll, it depends on what you get, how high your loan to value is. It could be anywhere from one to two and a half percent above prime. So prime is right now three and a quarter and you get, let's say one and a half over it, your rate's 4.75. But now you start adding those quarter hits that the feds are gonna do next year and the year after. Now you can see your rate going up to five, five and a half. So it really just depends on the borrower. It's all unique situation. Do they have a low principal balance and now they're gonna have a high second? They might not like that. Um, so it, it's just, Educating the borrower, and that's a conversation I'll have with them, telling them how they can pull cash out. We can do cash out right now if you've already identified a property or if you're going to get into something in the next six months. Maybe this might be better because you can lock all of your monies into this low three and a half percent versus doing the equity line and then buying something six months and then pulling the money out. And guess what happens? You've got a low first rate. But then now you've got a high balance on the second because you set it up for two, two fifty, three hundred thousand dollar equity line, and all of a sudden that rate's going from four point seven five all the way to six, and and they're going whoa, that's not kind of what I wanted to do. And the problem with that is you can't really reset the clock and say, wait a minute, I want to go back to where rates were a year ago and lower my rates, right? So th those are the two ways to pull cash out. But um, you're right, Camilla. It's like, you just have to make sure that when you talk to the client, what is your goal? Is it immediate? Is it short-term or is it long-term in terms of when you're trying to buy this? Um, Cause well, if you're doing it based on the, uh, the fact or the presumed fact that rates are going up, it doesn't make sense unless you're using it right away to do that. But um, at the same token, it's a, it's, it's money that you have there. So are there any scenarios, I'm trying to think, I heard recently of a scenario where you can take out the line, uh, the equity out of your home without refinancing. Is that to pay off a, a school loan? What, is there a condition in which you don't have to refinance? Well, when you do an equity loan, you don't really refinance. You're just financing a second when you do a, a, a HELOC. So it's not a refinance. It's but the just, HELOC ties in the rate? No. No, a HELOC yeah. is, is- So a, in the scenario where you can take it out and and have the payment, but you don't have to refinance, is there some, was it a, was there some some condition that has to be met that you wouldn't have to do that? Well, I, th I think, are you talking about a bridge loan type thing? Is that what I you're know. talking about? I, th I thought I heard somebody say that to me where you could pull out the money, you don't have to refinance, but it was conditional. I think to pay off a student loan, maybe? Is that? That, that, that I don't know. I okay. mean, I, it, it's not anything on our lending but it, side. I mean, it's, right. it's not relevant in this case, but you could take at least more than what you, oh, for my example, I owe money for my daughter's school. So if that's a, an exemption, could you take out double that, pay off the student loan and not actually refinance the, the home. I don't know. If you don't know. Yeah, no, because I can tell you any lender who's going to allow you to take money is going to want interest from day one. So yeah. you're always going to be paying on it because that's the reason why they're loaning money is they're trying to make money. So you're always going to pay interest from day one. The, the beauty no, of it, I, Yeah, I just mean not having to start like on your home if you're down 
uh, not just not having to refinance and start your, you know, 30 years over. Right. And, and that's why you would do a HELOC because you just take a second, you you pay as you go. If you don't have a balance, you have no monthly payment, just like on your credit card. If you don't have a balance, you don't have a monthly payment, but you can still charge on it later on. Two months down the line, you want to buy, I don't know, a refrigerator and you can, you know, apply and, and just put it on your card. It's the same way as the HELOC. Um, so you can do that. Good question. Yeah, uh, just just to recap this back to you, make sure I got this right. So if someone's looking to buy, this is actually uh, something that is very much uh, what what what's in store for me. Uh, I'm looking to buy some investment property and buy a single family home to live in in the next five to ten years. And you're saying, if I got this right, buy buy the investment property first, because then you have the you 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 might be better off as far as a coming up with a down payments because I can get buy the investment property, rent it out, take out a HELOC, uh, take take out some, some of the equity and use that to help pay for the down payment on the single family. Sure, that could happen. Could I mean, do that. But is there a way to do that that, that, the, that the money you take out is not tied to prime? Or is it always going to be because it's always going to be a home equity? Loan? If it's a second, it's always going to be tied to prime. Yeah. If it's a second, it's just, it is what it is. Yeah. It's going to be tied to prime. Um, if you pull it out, then it's part of your first trustee if you do a cash out refi. But yes, it's always better to buy units first because again, you can buy units with lower down if it's owner occupied because you can, you can buy units with an FHA loan if it qualifies with as little as three and a half percent down. But Ed, the distinction is you have to, I mean, you're, you're living in that, let's say it's a duplex, you're agreeing to live in it. So I don't know if you heard that part. Yeah. So you have to live in one and rent it out. And that's how you right. exactly. get the benefit of the owner. Right. And, and, and typically it's someone who's a renter now, right? Because they don't own, because they want right. to own and they want to buy property. So they don't own. So there's never the question of if they're going to live in the property. The problem is when you buy SFR or, you, you know, in, in that's your primary and now you want to buy units and you say, no, 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 I want to live in those units. It's a hard sell to an underwriter to tell them, yeah, they're going to go from your own personal SFR property to a duplex, triplex, fourplex where it's community property. That's a really tough sell. I mean, you'd have to have a great explanation. And, you know, there, there's occasion where it could happen, but it's very difficult. But the other way around all day long, if you went from two, three, four units to an SFR, no one's even going to question it. They're going to say, yeah, you're going from a community property area to your own individual space. Or out of, or out of state, a uh, second home. Yeah. In, and you can even buy a second home in state. It just depends. Like yeah, either. proximity, right? It can't be right in the same neighborhood you're living yeah. in. Yeah, exactly. Like I just closed a guy who bought a property. He was living in L.A., he bought a property in Fresno, and right now we're doing a second home in PV, and he's and it's a multi-million dollar property, and he's buying it second home, and he can do that because he bought almost a million dollar property in Fresno, but he, his his rationale is he wants to be tied to LA because he owns apartment complexes in LA, he loves the area, but he wanted to get out of the big city, but he still wants to have a place to come back and live, and that's why he's buying in um, Palos Verdes. And it, it just becomes a quality. But he's renting out his Fresno place, I'm sure. No. Eventually. He makes good enough money that, no. see, it's a qualifying thing. Because second home, you get no rental income. So he has to qualify for the property in Fresno and the property here with no rental. But I'm income. saying I'm sure he'll promptly make it a rental in oh, a few yeah. months. Yeah. Well, <laughs> not really. The son's going to live in the Fresno property. Hey, Chris? I hear <laughs> nothing. I hear nothing. Hey, exactly. <laughs> I got a question for you. Uh, as far as the second home, are the qualification and rates are different for second home? Yes. The rates are, are, are a little bit higher than owner occupied. There's not really a step on. There's only a half add to the rate um, in fee, not to rate. I'm sorry, oh. half add to fee. Um, so the rates are very similar. Uh, qualifying is a lot different because with a rental property, you have a rental income from the property to help you offset the mortgage payment, right? as we went through that 75% calculation. But when we talk about second home, you told the lender, I'm not renting it out, it's my second home. So I have no, no rental income. So you have to qualify for your current debt load plus the new property, total PITI. And as long as you qualify for it, sure. 
But as Camille was saying, you do have to make sure there's proximity issues. I mean, you can't buy in Redondo Beach and say, I'm buying a second home in Manhattan Beach. I think it's 50, uh, 50 miles, isn't it? it? It depends on investor. FHA requires 100 miles. Um, it just depends. Um, because we're so close to some things, I don't think it has to be 100 miles. I mean, you could, you could, buy, you could buy somewhere in like Gardena um, as a second home. Uh, I'm sorry, you could buy something there and, and probably buy uh, somewhere in the, the coast as a second home if it was a condo or something like that. I mean, sure. So it could be less than 50, but it's going to be investor case by case. That's all they tell us when it comes to second homes It's case by case. Um, unless you're dealing with a government loan, then again, it's hard, fast, 100 miles. And, and I've got tripped up where they do an actual test and it was 92 miles and it got declined. So... Uh, difference of eight miles, huh? Eight miles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. hard fast. But I mean, it, it's a great way for people to buy and, and build equity. Um, you know, especially when you look at what the market's done and you look at it really what's going to happen over the next few years. I know there's a lot of people sitting telling us, oh, it's going to balloon and we're going to see values decrease uh, or plummet. That may be true at some point in time, but it's not going to happen in the next two, three, four years. We will see the rate of growth slow. Absolutely. We're not going to see 20% year over year. We'll, we'll probably see those back into the single digits, but there's just not enough inventory. I don't have to tell you guys that. You guys live in that when you guys are looking for the properties for your own buyers. There's just not a lot of inventory. And we live in an impacted area where there's not a lot of land, so they can't really develop a lot. You know, So all of a sudden it becomes this issue of like, you need someone to leave to open up a space for someone to buy. So until all that happens, when there's more out there for people to leave, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna be here for a while, at least for a, a next couple of years, because uh, there's not a lot of development, although it's starting to pick up. We're starting to see that pick up and it's gonna happen over a period of time, but we need supply to meet demand before we're gonna see any kind of blow up in prices. In, in my opinion, I, I just think the factors with, even with rates going up, I think rates going up are actually is a good thing for you guys um, because it's going to get a lot of people off the fence to buy. It's going to go with sellers to get off the fence to sell because it's going to signal to them, hey, the end's sooner than you think. And if you want to capitalize on the market at the height, Mr. Seller, you should do it now because as the rates go up, they're going to say, oh, values are coming down. I don't know about that. They're going to slow the growth, sure. But it doesn't matter. As long as they think the values are coming down, that'll prompt them to sell. And hopefully we get a little bit more inventory to help the buyers. And we'll get a little bit more of an equilibrium and back to a normal market versus this seller market that's just insane. Um, but anyway. Hey, Chris, I have a question. Sure. So um, regarding a, an owner-occupied, say... I purchased a four unit and I move into one of the units. Um, what's the timeline? Is, is, there, is there a clear timeline as, as, long, as far as how long I need to stay? Can I move out two weeks later and decide, you know, this place isn't for me and fill it with a renter and then, you know, go on to buy a single family? Or is it, and you had mentioned a year earlier. I've heard three months in other places. Well, it's actually a year and, and you're going to test that with a document that you'll sign on your loan documents. You're going to say oh, okay. you're there for a year. Um, can you move out before? It just depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to, if you're just going to go rent somewhere, sure, you can work, you can move out. You never really even need to move in. You didn't hear from me, but no one ever checks, right? It just has to appear that you're going to live in the property at the time of close. And if you're a renter now and you're buying something, of course, they're going to think that you're going to move in. Now, if you're trying to buy something else, you probably need a few months under your belt because you're going to have to have a reason why you're, you did what you did, right? Because they're going to see it. They, they see it on your credit report. They're going to pull a, a fraud alert behind. They'll see any properties that's associated with your name. They're going to be able to see that your name is tied with, with another property. They'll do the property profile. They'll see that you got on title just three months ago. So even if you don't disclose it, it's still going to be found out. So it doesn't really matter. The question will be is, well, you just bought this property three months ago and it was four units. Um, did you buy it owner occupied or non-owner occupied? And they're going to ask you. And the end, underwriter can ask us to get a copy of the note to prove that you bought it owner occupied. 
I mean, they can, it just depends on, uh, on the underwriter. Um, so to your question though, very specific, like how long do I have to live in it? it there's really no hard cut date of like after three months, you're free and clear. But the further away you get, the easier it is to explain. And you're probably going to make an explanation like this. Like I bought the property. I didn't realize in the neighborhood that it was. There's a lot of shoddy characters that, that are constantly hanging out at the corner. I've got two young kids. I really fear for their, their safety. And, you know, unfortunately, I really can't sell it. But I can't live there with my family. And that's the reason why I'm moving on. So if there's some sort of health and safety issue like that, they'll probably say, okay. It could be for school district, but typically it's, you want to use it, it, it because of the neighborhood and there's a reason why you want to get out of it. Um, the other thing could be maybe someone bought something and all of a sudden their job transferred, right? And, and yeah. so um, it has to be a really bona fide reason if you're trying to get it less than 12 months. After 12 months, you have no issues. No one's ever going to ask that at all. I, I would think if, if I was to tell someone how long, Three months would be the bare minimum. I would try to get to six to nine months if you could. But again, that's all case by case and you just have to have a good explanation. And what, and what you're saying, Chris, is three months minimally, six months, maybe 12 months, ideally to go buy another property. And then well, nobody cares. By, yeah, move but out. But if you home. bought one, you know, and you, you bought it owner occupied and then you try to get another loan, they just might not give you a loan. Is there any recourse from the initial lender when they find out that, oh, you said it, you're living in it and you're no longer living in it? No. Or you never lived in it? Not really. I mean, there is recourse because, again, in, in, the, in the loan documents when you sign, there's like 60 forms and there's, yeah. there's a template in there. There's a sheet that's saying you're going to live in it. And they can come back to you and say, hey, you signed right here. It said you were going to live in it for 12 months, right? Um, but there's no, there's no policing of it. That's just it. You know, the lender doesn't really have a watchdog to go out there and look at the property and knock on the, the door and say, hey, are you actually in this property and, and inspect? So unless they do that, how are they ever going to catch it, right? So that, that's, that's where it all comes down to is, I guess in theory it could happen, but in reality, never going to happen. As long as you're paying them, I think. As long as I, you know, I think that's the key. You know, if you're paying them, there's no problem with the loan repayment. I don't think anybody's going to bother you. Yeah, but exactly. If some, but if it goes into foreclosure and all that, then they can come after you for fraud because you did right. not do this. Right. It's, you know, it's just one of those things that not, nobody's going to really know until actually you trigger something. You trigger that, right. Because there's no policing of it. They're not going to come knocking on your door unless, like you said, you trigger it because you didn't make the payment, right? But if you didn't make the payments, you're not going to get another loan because they got bad credit. So, you know, you're in a you're. So it's. You guys Soul was trying to hop around I, I and buy investment property. So we just have a couple more minutes. So just like one or two more questions. Oh sure, yeah. Now I was just going to say it's is it is just kind of a stop or kind of a check to keep somebody from trying to accumulate investment properties by living there for a couple months at a time and then with only three and a half, five percent down and then moving on to the next, I guess that. Or never the living there and saying they are living there. Right. Yeah. Well, you, yeah. You, because you came in with a low down. I mean, you, you said it was owner occupied. You tried to get in with 5%, which you did. And now it's you're turning it into a rental. Um, so that, that's really what it's designed for because you, you, there's the added risk. Remember I talked about rates and why the rate's higher for a non-owner than owner because of the risk involved. So that's, right, yeah. that's what it comes down to is the added layer of risk because it's, it's a rental property now. And so when you get into trouble financially, the first properties that are going to go are your rentals before your primary. That's just the way it's going to be. Um, so, you know, and, and the thing is, I, I wanted to make this distinction too. If you buy a rental property, today you can buy another rental property next month and another one the next month the next one as long as you've got the money to do it so yeah. this is only if you're trying to buy it as owner occupied and then move out and buy another one owner occupied that's i want to make that distinction so if you're buying something today as an investment as as a non-owner next month you can buy another one as an investment and non-owner as long as you've got the money and it qualifies so you know, if you, if you hit the lotto and you've got, you know, you hit a million dollars, you can put the first 250 towards one property 
and it cash flows, great. And then you still have 750 left in the bank and buy another one for another 250, a million dollar property, 25% down. Buy another one, you keep doing that until your assets are depleted, sure. So there's no time from that if, if that's the question as well. If you buy an owner, non-owner today, you can buy another one next month as well. All right, guys, on that note, we got to wrap it up here for, for the week. Uh, by the way, this is going to be our last, uh, our last, what do you call it, working on wealth until the first week of January. It's over the January 6th or whatever that day is. Uh, I hope you guys all have a happy holidays. It's been fun growing this class with you. And I hope you all make it back and don't forget about us uh, first week of January. And uh, this was really good as always. Thank you to Chris. Thank uh, you, Chris. Well, anytime. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Ed. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas, Happy everybody. Happy holidays, Thank everyone. Thank you. Bye. We'll see you guys in 2022. 2022. 2022. God, crazy, right? 2022. <laughs> All right, guys. See ya.